Thanks for tuning in, folks. Alex Pettit here, editor of the Eugene O'Neill Review, beaming at you from Texas. You know, it's cold down here, nearly four days of a deep freeze. So even though Texas didn't turn blue, a whole lot of Texans did. Well, we'll take whatever we can get. Eugene O'Neill Review 43.1 will hit mailboxes, actual and virtual, in March. It's a strong issue, I think, and I'm pleased to say that it finds the journal inching from the gloomy to the encomiastic, in one instance at least. Why? Even as we move through centennial celebrations of O'Neill's great plays from the 1920s, we've also hit an important semi-centennial on the secondary side. 2022 marks the 50th anniversary of Oxford UP's publication of Travis Bogard's Contour in Time, the plays of Eugene O'Neill, which, trust me, is still among the two or three most cited books in O'Neill studies. I can't offer champagne, but I can offer a special installment of our used book feature featuring comprising reevaluations by Brenda Murphy, Jackson Breyer, and David Clare. Murphy offers a meticulous contextualization of Bogard's book in the history of O'Neill criticism. Breyer revisits his history of friendship and collaboration with Bogard, offering both insight and warmth. The younger Clare applauds the book's durability while tactfully nicking Bogard for his lack of interest in O'Neill's Irishness. Now, speaking of Irishness, the new Lost and Found will remind scholars of Irish drama and Irish theater history of their good fortune in sharing the planet with Christopher Murray, a critic, scholar, writer, and colleague of uncommon merit. The Lost here is a 1936 letter from O'Neill to the Irish American political activist Patrick McCartan, who had forwarded to O'Neill an invitation from W.B. Yeats to attend the Abbey Theater's premiere of Days Without End. Working outward from O'Neill's slight missive, Murray creates a history and miniature of that production and goes a long way toward rehabilitating a play that I agree is too easily and too often overlooked. Murray always makes it look easy. It's not. This one's a marvel. The practitioner's colloquium shines as well, even in such luminous company. Patrick Midgley interviews the director, Brendan Fox, and several of his collaborators in the highly regarded 2019 American stage production of Long Day's Journey and Tonight. Midgley is a subtle and genial interviewer who's drawn much insight from his subjects, although I'm pretty sure I could hear the clinking of glassware behind the lines once or twice. Fox emerges as an equally intellectual and intuitive director, which much to offer O'Neill scholars and enthusiasts. May I suggest A Moon for the Misbegotten, Mr. Fox? All this in two strong essays. Caitlin Farrell Rodriguez, a graduate student from Texas Austin, discusses the infant infantilization of the too old for that young man of long day's journey, death of a salesman and the glass menagerie. She embraces the responsibilities of interdisciplinary scholarship. Sure, we all know that the Tyrone boys at Ali's struggle to keep their big boy pants on the top sides of their bottoms. But this close engagement with the literature of developmental psychology gives that recognition new depth and resonance. Finally, former O'Neill Foundation artist in residence, Dan Benning, checks in from the Electric City, Schenectady, New York, a stone's throw from the birthplaces of James A. Hearn and Y-O-U-R-S truly. Benning's race and gender conscious history of the Pulitzer Prize for drama is plenty interesting per se, and has the added benefit of including previously unpublished documents from the Dow House archives. See, most soberingly, the furious telegram from O'Neill to his agent, Richard Madding, forbidden the, forbidding the federal theater project to stage a, quote, Negro adaptation of the hairy ape and railing generally against the use of black actors in what O'Neill called his white plays. I suspect this essay will get plenty of attention in next year's O'Neill Society MLA panel on the dualities of race in Eugene O'Neill. Breathe deeply and sharpen your pencils. Fenning reminds us that Chris Christopherson bombed in Philadelphia. Happily, Bess Rowan has been flourishing there or so I gather from a receipt of a shiny new assistant professorship at Villanova, and from my own receipt of the many fine performance reviews that keep popping up in my inbox. Take it away, Bess. Thank you so much, Alex, for that lovely introduction. Uh, I am indeed, I have been kept very busy in a good way by the Metropolitan Virtual Playhouse. Uh, I have five performance reviews in the section for this, edi for this edition, uh, and I, have four out of the five of them are actually concentrated on the Metropolitan Virtual Playhouse. 
We start off with a wonderful review from my insightful department chair and friend, Valerie Joyce from Villanova, uh, writing about the last will and testament of Silverdine Emblem O'Neill, known as Bleamy to his uh, friends and his owners. He was, of course, the O'Neill's faithful dog. And uh, Alex Rowe himself steps in to do a wonderful reading of this piece. And um, Valerie Joyce is also a dog lover, so that's a really nice matchup. And I think we get a lot of the energy and personality out of that review uh, that I felt was present in the performance itself. We next move on to our wonderful friend and colleague, uh, Noelia Hernando Real from the Glasswell Society, who stepped in to cover Enemies, a play by Neith Boyce and Hutchkins Hapgood, some Provincetown players, folks who don't always get nearly as much airtime. And Noelia does a wonderful job of um, really situating this within the context of the Provincetown players. And this is another great offering from the Metropolitan Virtual Playhouse. Then we move on to uh, yours truly, who's the only one not covering a Metropolitan Virtual Playhouse production. Instead, I brought you a dual review, one of a production of Susan Glassbell's Trifles, which was done by Open Stage Production from Harrison, Pennsylvania, which was streaming. And then uh, an adaptation of really an extension of what happens to our unseen character, Minnie Wright, in Trifles uh, into a one woman show by Milbrid Birch called Sometimes I Sing, which was a really interesting solo piece. So uh, since those are obviously thematically related, I put them together in that way. But then we move on to a wonderful uh, heavy hitting, not one, not two, but three productions in one review from uh, my dear friend and colleague, uh, Jennifer Joan Thompson, who is talking about Not Smart by Wilbur Daniel Steele, The Silent Waiter by Alfred Kramborg, and Winter's Night, another one by Neith Boyce, all of these, again, from the Metropolitan Virtual Playhouse. And she does a wonderful job of, again, showing us this kind of chunk of the season in context in this really lovely way. And then last but not least, uh, we have my other friend uh, and colleague, I think you're seeing a pattern here probably, Catherine Weiss, uh, who brings us the Metropolitan Virtual Playhouse's version of Trifles. So there's some fun kind of uh, callbacks within the performance review section this particular time. And uh, she, again, does a really lovely job of talking about what that production looked like. And I think you can really see the different approach, even within streaming versions of Trifles, between the version I saw and the version Catherine Weiss covers. Uh, so it's really lovely to see some streaming theater and uh, to visit things in the virtual world. But for those of you missing something a bit more concrete, Let's go back to the print and paper world of books. And uh, for that, I will leave it to my talented friend and colleague, Xander. Uh, turning it over to you, Xander, take it away. Thank you very much, Bess. Uh, congratulations again on your new professorship at Villanova. Expected news, welcome news, and deserved news. Congratulations. Two books this time in the book section of the Eugene O'Neill Review. The first of which is Sheila Garvey's book, Circle in the Square Theater, A Comprehensive History. Comprehensive being the operative word here. Uh, this book is about 350 to 400 oversized pages, covers the complete uh, history of Circle. Square Theater from its infancy in about 19, early 1950s to all the way to the present day and uh, all its various manifestations of uh, how it functioned with its various leaders through the years. Uh, I'm pretty certain that if there's information about the Circle and the Square Theater that you would like to know and you cannot find it in Sheila's book, I'm pretty sure you don't need to know it. Uh, it is a project that Sheila started in graduate school at NYU. It was her dissertation, uh, and she finished it and published it uh, in, 19, in 2020, 2021 uh, for McFarland Press. Um, 
I would point out that the book is not one that laid fallow all those years. It went from a dissertation to she com continued to work on it, continued to revise it for really all the years in between. Uh, and, and is a really a, a labor of, of love uh, in that uh, she was intimate friends with a lot of the people involved in, in that theater. She knew Jose Quintero. She knew Ted Mann very well and had access to his files. And she also very good friends with Paul Libin, who was later Ted Mann's partner. Uh, she knew Colleen Dewhurst very well. There's a great interview with Colleen about playing uh, Mary Tyrone in Long Day's Journey into Night, uh, part of which I stole for a, that's something I'm working on right now. So O'Neill scholars will find lots to mine in her in these pages. Lots of stories about Jason Robards as well, whom Sheila also uh, considered a friend and had uh, interviewed on multiple occasions. So it's just a treasure trove of information and Ann Fletcher, uh, former uh, artist in residence at the O'Neill Foundation and a uh, full professor at Southern Illinois University is the perfect person to review this book. And she did a great job. She's a theater historian herself. She's an expert on uh, American theater, the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, she's co-edited uh, a book on dramaturgy uh, she's, uh, 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 she very, uh, uh, she spent a long time digesting this book, uh, and she does what I think all good reviews should do. Uh, she encapsulates the entire book in 1800 words. And at the same time, she has enough things in the book that will actually make you want to read it. So, um, it's really, a, a, a I think you'll, uh, enjoy, uh, her review. Um, the other review uh, in the book I'm, I'm less certain about uh, because it's about my book, uh, which came out in 2021, Magnum Opus, The Cycle Plays of Eugene O'Neill. And I say I don't know much about the review because I haven't read it uh, in the interests of uh, integrity, which we're all about at the Eugene O'Neill Review. Uh, so I'm sure that if he says plenty of good things, that will mean it's a good review. Um, actually, I'm pretty sure it'll be a good review. Anyway, Christopher Morash, the reviewer, is the uh, Seamus Haney Professor of Irish Writing at Trinity College, Dublin. He's an expert on all things Irish. Uh, he's an expert on modern drama. He uh, has a new book on Yeats and theater. Uh, and he frequently appears over here in the States, uh, lecturing and appearing at theaters, uh, talking about Irish theater and uh, modern drama uh, in general. So uh, that's likely to be uh, something you want to read there. So those are our two books this time. Uh, we'll have a couple more books next issue. Uh, and now we return to our fearless leader, Alex Pettit. Thanks so much, colleagues, for these uh, wonderful uh, overviews. Uh, three clusters uh, formed or reformed uh, in my mind uh, as I was hearing your uh, informed thoughts on these various features. Uh, things I thought about when I was compiling the issues were things that seem even clearer to me now. Uh, first of all, uh, boy, ever since, uh, ever since the Galway Conference, the line between the society and Ireland has been really strong and really productive. We have contributions from three top-notch Irish scholars in this issue, spanning three generations. How wonderful. Uh, newcomers, uh, a big commitment of mine and indeed ours, all of ours here at the Journal and in the Society. Uh, Bess is bringing in so much new blood. Uh, her list of friends seems to be remarkably uh, extensive. I can only envy that, uh, that, that circumstance. But more to the present point, her friends uh, seem to comprise uh, exclusively or perhaps pr predominantly uh, remarkably talented writers and critics. Not only are we getting lots of new voices in the EOR, we're getting lots of really good writing and keen scholarship. Uh, also, uh, how wonderful to have contributions from three of the most able, uh, learned, 
and insightful elders in our community. Uh, Brenda Murphy, Jackson Breyer, and, uh, and Chris Murray. Working with those folks, just, you know, a little bit older than I and uh, much more learned, uh, is always a pleasure and always humbling as well in just the right sort of way. We have so much to learn from their craft, their brains, and their, uh, their geniality. Uh, what do we need moving ahead? Folks, we need more uh, essays. Stay in touch. I know a lot of you are listening to this. Uh, it's not a podcast. It's a, I don't know what it is. This, this presentation are uh, thinking, should I write an article on Eugene O'Neill? Or maybe I should send that next article to, on Eugene O'Neill to, well, the way to finish that sentence is to the Eugene O'Neill Review. Uh, please keep us uh, up to date on your work always looking for good essays to send out to review. Uh, we pride ourselves on excellent readers reports and really quick turnaround time. So please stay in touch. Look forward to hearing from you, not only on your own work or about your own work, but also with your comments on this issue of the EOR. Please feel free to share them with me at eoreditor at gmail.com. Again, my sincere thanks to all of you. So long.